to fill the God-shaped hole in our heart, the God-shaped hole that we were born with. That's my testimony right there. He asked me, how did I come to Christ? That's the short version. It's also the full version. Last month I celebrated 29 years walking with the Lord. And my life up till that point was almost that many years of trial and error and error and trial and trying to fill that hole with something, with anything. I was like a four-year-old with a jigsaw puzzle. Does this fit? (laughs) Maybe that fits. I'm going to make this fit. And I tried lots of things. I tried lots of things individually. I tried a bunch of things in a bunch of combinations. School and sports and various substances and relationships and recognition and jobs and, of course, the out-of-control sex addiction that had its grip on me when I finally, Jesus finally broke me. And the thing about trying to force all of that stuff into my heart, trying to force fit those pieces of the world, those things of the world into my heart, it directly affected what came out of my heart, out of my mouth, into my life, into the people around me. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or or my favorite translation of that verse, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And boy, was my heart full of Well, some not very great stuff. You know the sponge analogy, right? What comes out of a sponge when you squeeze it, when you put pressure on it? Whatever the sponge has been soaking up. What came out of my heart before Christ was never very good, and a lot of times it was really bad, and it was never Jesus, because that's that's not what I was soaking up. That's not what I was filling my heart with, so there was no Jesus in my heart to come out. No Christ-likeness to be made manifest. Even today, save for 29 years, a pastor for more than 20 years, even today it's still true. What comes out of my mouth is whatever my heart is full of. And you know me well enough to know that what comes out of my mouth, what radiates from my heart to my tongue to my life is not always pretty. Because what I'm choosing in my heart is not always Jesus. (gasps) <gasps> how can that be how did you, you you just said that you chose jesus almost 30 years ago i did 29 years ago and some days i chose jesus i've chosen jesus but i'm not always choosing jesus 29 years ago i was filled with the holy spirit but i'm not always being filled with the spirit I don't always choose to walk in the Spirit. And and the really twisted part about all of it, even today, I don't always know at any given moment which I'm choosing. Am I walking in the Spirit? Am I walking in the flesh? If you roll up on me and pop quiz, you know, hey, what? what, You're walking in the Spirit or the flesh? I don't always know the answer. I can know if if I take the time to think about the question. It's easy to know. I just don't always take the time. I don't always monitor myself. I don't always stop and ask myself, am I walking in the spirit or am I walking in the flesh? And it's an important question that I really should be asking much more. Some people don't know that it is a question. Other people just don't don't like the question. I remember rolling up on a couple of brothers, brothers in the Lord who were getting a little heated with one another. And I figured I would be a pastor and try to de-escalate things. And one of them was really just, you know, speaking some heat. And I said, come on, man, that's not a very Christian way to speak. And he says, it is too, because I'm a Christian and I'm speaking. (laughs) I I think he genuinely didn't understand, just, just like a lot of people don't understand. Just because we're saved by Jesus doesn't mean that everything that we say or do is automatically from Jesus. Not everything I do as a Christian is necessarily Christ-centered or Christ-honoring. In fact, nothing I do as a Christian will be Christ-centered or Christ-honoring unless I am actively choosing to walk in the Spirit of Christ and not in my flesh. Patrick, are are you sure you have the right chapter? Because it sounds like you're getting ready to talk about Ephesians 5. You're right. When we get to Ephesians 5, Paul's going to have a lot to say about this. 
But it also bears on the passage that's in front of us this morning. Even as Christians, we still have a choice. Walk in the Spirit, walk in the flesh. And we get to make that choice every moment of every day. Not just once when we come to Christ, not just once when we wake up in the morning. That would be fantastic. Wake up, turn off the alarm. Jesus, fill me with your Spirit. Equip me for the day, anoint me to love people in your name, amen. Okay, I'm good for 24 hours. Don't get me wrong, that's a really important way to start the day because we never wake up in the spirit. We always wake up in the flesh. If you're not sure about that, ask your spouse. (laughs) If you don't have a spouse, ask your parents. Parents, ask your children. I'm really sure I'm right about this. It's a good thing to to, to ask for a fresh filling of of the Spirit in the morning. But if we want to walk with the Lord through the day and, and speak with the Lord through the day and speak for the Lord through the day, we need to keep choosing Jesus. We need to keep asking Jesus to guide and decide and supply. We need to let him keep filling, filling to overflowing the God-shaped hole in our heart. When we get to Ephesians 5, Paul is going to say, be being filled, present ongoing condition, be being filled continually with the Spirit. And when we are, it's not hard to tell. Paul told us in Galatians 5 what to look for. Galatians 5, Paul described the fruit of the Spirit, you know them, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these things are a product of of walking in the Spirit. And if I stop and ask the question, and if I'm honest about the answer, it's not hard to tell if I'm walking in the Spirit or the flesh. What's the fruit like? What's coming out of my life? What's what's the fragrance I'm leaving in my wake? Does it smell like like the fruit of the Spirit, or does it smell like feet? (laughs) If I stop and ask the question, it's not hard to tell. If I can see genuine fruit of the Spirit, if that's what I'm doing, if that's how I'm showing up, if that's what others are seeing, if that's how others are experiencing me, then I'm walking in the Spirit. Because flesh can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. Not on an ongoing basis. They can fake it for a while, but they can't sustain it. So if I see myself doing those things, and especially if others bear witness that that's how they're experiencing me, because love is about others, and love is about actions, not intentions, right? Right? If those are the things I'm constantly doing, because love does, then I'm walking in the Spirit. The Spirit is what my heart is full of. The Spirit is what is overflowing from it. But if I can't see that, if others aren't experiencing that, then I'm not. If I stop and ask the question, it's not hard to tell. For me, the challenge is is stopping to ask. Which is it, spirit or flesh? Who's in the driver's seat right now? The Holy Spirit or big fat dope named Patrick? I get that this is well-traveled ground for most of us, for, for many of us at least. If, if, if this is new, oh, buckle up, because Ephesians 5 is going to blow your mind. And if you don't want to wait that long, g- grab me, let's, let's talk, because the idea of being filled with the Spirit, that'll revolutionize your life as a Christian. But I begin this way this morning, even before we get to Ephesians 5, because it's relevant to the section Not just the chapter, but the section of Ephesians that we begin this morning. Last week we finished up chapter 3, and with it we finished up the first big division of Ephesians. The first three chapters, Paul's all about telling us who we are in Christ. That was chapters 1, 2, and 3. Who are we in Christ? Who has God made us, chosen us, and made us to be? Now chapter 4, 5, and 6, the second section, Paul's going to shift gears And he turns his attention to exhorting us how we live for Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Therefore, Paul says. He's pivoting. He's looking back and he's he's saying, in light of everything I've been saying, in light of everything we've been talking about, in light of everything that we are in Christ, who we are individually reconciled to God, who we are collectively reconciled to each other. In light of all of that, Paul says, 
Choose Christ. We are who we are because Christ chose us, right? Chose to love us, chose to come for us, chose to tabernacle among us, chose to die for us. Now choose him, Paul's imploring us. Choose him and keep choosing him. What does that look like? Paul's going to spend the next three chapters telling us. But spoiler alert, comes down to one word. Want to guess? Love. Yeah. I also heard Jesus. That also works. Because they're synonyms, right? Love is what the next three chapters are about. Walk worthy, Paul says, verse 1, of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. <clears throat> Paul just got done in chapter 3 talking about the family that God has brought together in Christ. Talking about how he tore down the wall of animosity between Jew and Gentile and, and by extension made irrelevant every other difference that, that might exist between people in the body of Christ people who are still very different, different background, different cultures, different experiences, different calling, gifting, convictions about certain matters. But in and through all of that, Paul just got done telling us one body. Different in many aspects, but none of the things that make us different are nearly as important as the things that we have in common. One Father, one Savior, one family in Christ. Look around, Paul is saying. This collection of weirdos, this island of misfit toys you found yourself stranded on, these are your brothers and sisters now. This is your family. And you need to find a way to get along. You need to find a way to honor the God who made you family. You need to be family. You need to love one another because loving one another honors god because loving one another obeys god loving other loving one another manifests god because we can't love each other without god and loving one another enables god to use us our gifts our calling our roles as his body for his glory love one another paul says and that sounds like a great idea Love one another. Who's going to argue with that? Seriously. Two great commandments. Love God, love each other. That's fine. That's good. Fantastic. I'm with you. Until Paul starts to get specific about what it looks like. Until he gets granular. Until he starts describing what it means. With all lowliness and gentleness. With long-suffering. Bearing with one another in love. Hmm. Lowliness and gentleness, let's define our terms. Lowliness is an inward condition. It's related to humility. It's a willingness to take the last place. It's a willingness to say, I must decrease that he might increase. It's, it's, it's a determined position, not I, but Christ in me. That lowliness, it's an inward condition. It's, it's an inward decision to walk in the Spirit. Gentleness is the outward manifestation of that decision. It's the fruit that comes from choosing Christ in our heart, choosing to be like him, choosing to be lowly. Not once 30 years ago or three years ago or three hours ago, but moment by moment by moment, again and again and again. This is what we've been talking about, right? It's, it's letting the love of Christ overflow our hearts. If Christ is in our hearts, if we're choosing Christ, then what is going to overflow from our hearts is Christ and the love of Christ. And one of the manifestations of that love that Paul highlights, one that I want to explore a little bit this morning, is gentleness. 
Because despite everything that Paul just said, and despite everything that Jesus says, and despite everything Jesus does, lowliness and gentleness, and especially gentleness, have somehow become controversial in the body of Christ, especially in our country. Which seems strange to me because it's black letter scripture. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. I've got to sing the song to get them, but. <laughs> gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, which makes sense because God is gentle, and Jesus is gentle, and the Holy Spirit is gentle. Jesus is gentle? Yeah. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10.1, about the meekness and gentleness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.1. Jesus is gentle. So, so even if we didn't have those verses in Galatians to fall back on, the fruit of the Spirit verses, we still know, we still see that Jesus is gentle. And doesn't the gentleness of Christ of necessity demand the gentleness of the Christ follower? talked about the gentleness of Christ before. I've talked about it here. I've talked about it in other churches. When I get invited to teach at a retreat or a conference or, a, or, or just fill in on a, on, a, on a Sunday morning, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. The Lord doesn't always lead me that way, but I'm really happy when he does. But it does make people uncomfortable. Not just the guys, but especially the guys. As soon as I start talking about gentleness. And as soon as people figure out that it's not just something that I'm going to hit in passing, but it's actually going to be a point of emphasis, you can see them shifting in their seats, leaning over. Where's he going with this? Sometimes people will even ask, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean by gentleness? And I, I love getting the question because then I get to answer it. What is gentleness? We know what it is physically, right? If I said define gentleness in a few words, you'd probably come up with something like handle with care. And, and that works. And the way that the Bible uses the term, gentleness means the exact same thing except relationally. Handle one another with care. Can you give me an example? Yeah, it's, it's listening to what someone thinks, not telling them what they need to think if they're a Christian. It's inviting someone into genuine discussion, not trying to bully them into agreement. It's calmly reasoning with the person that you disagree with, not mocking or ridiculing or demeaning them. It's trying to build up, not tear down, trying to find areas of, of agreement to begin with, not areas of disagreement that can be an excuse for abandonment. Gentleness is, is, is when we realize that we're in the wrong, apologizing and not rationalizing. And then I could keep going. That's not a complete list, but, it, but it's enough to, to communicate the idea. It's enough to paint a picture. And when, when I've done that, then I usually like to drop in a quote by Jerry Bridges. We've read some of Jerry Bridges' books in men's ministry over the years, and I like what he says about gentleness. He says, gentleness is illustrated by the way we would handle a carton of exquisite crystal glasses. It's the recognition that the human personality is valuable and fragile and must be handled with care. And as soon as I say that, the eye rolling starts and the murmuring begins. This is what's wrong with the church today. Emasculating our faith. Stripping Jesus of his manhood. He's trying, to, he's trying to turn Christian men into Christian women. <laughs> Pretty sure I'm not. In fact, I'm really sure that I'm not. And, and let me show you why I'm sure. Turn to Isaiah 40. Sorry, no slides this morning, but it actually works out well because I want you to put eyes on these verses in your own Bible. Maybe even underline them. The gospel according to Isaiah. That's what it seems like sometimes. We joked about that last year when we were going through Isaiah on Wednesdays. Isaiah's overflowing with insight about Jesus. I get that the volume of the book is written of him and that Jesus is on every page, but Isaiah especially is like super saturated with Jesus. As we turn to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 is a prophecy of the return of Jesus. And, and let's look at some of it together. Verse 9. 
O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Jesus is coming back. Look down to verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard Isaiah 40, 21? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It's he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in? He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. This is warrior Jesus returning to liberate Jerusalem. He's judging the nations. He's setting up his kingdom. And the thing the Holy Spirit wants us to see and and grasp and understand about Jesus in these verses, he is strong, right? The Jesus that we just read about is mighty. He is powerful. Plenty masculine there, right? No doubt about it. Scroll up to verse 10. Behold, the Lord God should come shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him. What's his reward? That's us. We're with him when he returns. His work before him, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. In the very same passage where we see Jesus' mighty warrior, we see him treat people how? Gently. What did we just learn? Learn might be the wrong word. Maybe it's not new. What did we just see? A couple things. One, gentle and feminine, not the same thing. Men can be gentle. What else did we just see? Gentle and weak, not the same thing. The more we study Scripture, the more we see gentleness and strength are closely related. It takes strength to be gentle. And gentleness makes us strong. It takes strength to make us gentle, and gentleness makes us strong. That's not my idea. I'm still ripping on Jerry Bridges a little bit. It's not not his idea either. It's what the Bible says. Psalm 1835. You can flip there if you can do it quickly or you you can just listen. One verse. Psalm 1835, half a verse. David says to God, your gentleness has made me great. That's New King James. NIV, you stoop down to make me great. One of the modern translations combines those two ideas. By stooping down in gentleness, you make me great. Gentleness is stooping down from a place of strength and reaching out to someone in their weakness, meeting them where they're at in the hopes of lifting them up. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Didn't he stoop down in gentleness to save us? Didn't he lower himself so that we could be lifted up with him? Isn't that the gospel? That God came as a man, tabernacled among us to teach us, and then laid down his life for us? If that's a new idea for you this morning, or you haven't decided what to do about that idea, talk to me afterwards. That's Jesus. That's the gentleness of Jesus. That's Jesus-style parenting. Picture, picture a child running away from a parent at Walmart. As a parent, you got a couple options. You can say, Benjamin Dugan, will you come back here right now? And be angry. Grab his arm, pull him off the ground. He's too big for that, but... <laughs> Plant him in the car. Don't you ever run off again. The other option is to bend down and say, hey, why don't you come back here? Come, come, come. It's scary out there. Come to me where it's safe. Let's, let's stay together. Let's do this store together. Let me protect you. 
I'm not saying there's not a place and a time for a good spot on the bottom. The Bible says there is. I'm asking which approach personifies Jesus. Jesus, who in Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. If the parenting analogy doesn't work for you, think about this. Your boss rolls up on you, convinced that you've done something very, very wrong. Maybe it's true, maybe it isn't. How do you want your boss to have that conversation with you? Loudly? Angrily? Publicly? All broadcast, no listening? Or do you want it to be a conversation? I'm gentle and lowly in heart. That's what Jesus says. And we see over and over in Scripture, that's what Jesus does. That's how he shows up in the, in the parable of the prodigal son, the woman caught in adultery, Peter at the lake after denying him three times, the woman at the well. Every time it's Jesus saying, look at me. No, no, lift up your head, look at me. Yeah, sin is sin, and, and, and you've got a bunch, but guess what? It's forgiven. It's going to be okay. Let's start again. Let's start together. Let's do this together. Follow me. We've got to let go of the idea that gentleness is frailty or vulnerability or weakness. There's no one in the universe less weak than Jesus. And there's no one in the universe more gentle than Jesus. Both of those things are true at the same time. He's lion and lamb both. So what does that imply? By the same token, there's no one in the world stronger than us. The power that empowered Jesus, the power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us. The Spirit of God empowers us to choose Him and to overflow with His love, which means there shouldn't be a person in the world gentler than the Christian. And sadly, that's, that's not always the case. In fact, I, I find that it's increasingly rarely the case in this country especially. A whole lot of Christians I know, a whole lot of Christians you know are anything but gentle and they're proud of it. Look, we all fall short some of the time. Me, a lot of the time. But, but there, there's some that aren't even trying. They don't want to be gentle, don't see the point in being gentle. Some of the time, all of the time, any of the time. What's up with that? Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be evident to all. Philippians 4, 5. It's not our last time encountering this idea. Let your gentleness be evident, seen, recognized, made manifest, known. But for a lot of the church, it's, it's like they're reading that verse backward, inside out, and upside down. Like it says the exact opposite. Don't let anyone think for a moment that you're gentle, ever. Don't let anyone see anything in you that looks like gentleness at all. And what's the result? The result is exactly what the Bible said it would be. Galatians 5.15, Christians biting and devouring each other. Brothers and sisters consuming each other. Galatians 5.15. Why? What are we so stinking afraid of? Do we care so much that the world might call us weak because we've walked away from our old lives and our old sin that we overcompensate by being hard? I might be Christian, but I'm rough and tough and king of the jungle. Listen, and, and, and you know this. I know you know this. The person who knows they're strong doesn't need to prove it. The great welder doesn't say, come here, come here, I want to see, look at this, this seam that I welded on this trailer. Is that pretty or what? The great carpenter doesn't say, look at this bookshelf. Here, just get the books off. Look, look, at, look at what, you can't even see where that fit in, do you? The great doctor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't pull up somebody's shirt. Look at this scar. Have you ever seen such a beautiful scar? The ones who need to flex, the ones obsessed with trying to convince you of their skill and talent and worth are the ones trying to convince themselves. So I'll ask again, what are we afraid of? 
What aren't we sure of? Do we really think so little of God that we care so much about the world thinks about us? Yeah, well, Jesus flipped tables. Chased the money changers out with a whip. That wasn't gentle. So here's the thing. When the conversation goes there, they're changing the subject. But any conversation about the gentleness of Christ is going to go there eventually, so let's go there. Every Christian's excuse for bad behavior, Jesus turning over tables. He actually did it twice. I mean, if we're going to talk about it, let's at least get the details right. He did it twice, once at the beginning of his ministry in John 2, and once at the end of his ministry, Matthew 21 and Mark 11, parallel passages. A couple things about Jesus flipping tables. First time, the disciples saw it, and they said to one another, John chapter 2, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is Psalm 69.9. He's consumed with the zeal of the Lord. They recognized in Jesus that the overflow of his heart was pure, godly motivation. If we want to flip tables like Jesus, before we get loud or aggressive, we got to ask ourselves, is this about me or God? Is what I'm about to do truly Christ in me? Or is this about how I want people to see me or how I want me to see me? Am I thinking of God or me? If I'm not thinking at all, there's an answer. I'm just reacting. That's not the Holy Spirit. But before I act in anger, be holy but sin not, before I use that as an excuse, is this what I'm about to do, ministry in Jesus' name? Am I walking in the Spirit? Can I do this as worship? Is this overflow of love? Or is this overflow of my frustration? Is this my seething anger, my flesh boiling over? It's an important question. Second thing about Jesus flipping tables. The second time he flips tables. Mark 11. Scripture makes a point of telling us where he was. Got to do a little homework, but, but you can figure out the place he was clearing out was the courtyard of the Gentiles. Why is that significant? That was the one place in the temple that Gentiles, non-Jews, you and me, were allowed to go. The one place where we were allowed to draw near and pray to God. And part of what Jesus is responding to in Mark 11, not reacting, responding, he tells us, Mark 11, verse 17, my father's house Quoting Isaiah and Jeremiah both, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. And it wasn't. The people in the courtyard of the Gentiles were hindering its intended function, hindering people like you and me from drawing near to God. Yeah, but he still wasn't gentle. He could have wiped them out with a thought. I think he was as gentle as he could and still accomplish a very necessary godly goal, which was to reclaim the space set aside for God to deal gently with the stranger, with the foreigner. Before we crank up the volume, and way before we get physical, we've got to ask, are my motives that pure? Am I walking in the Spirit? Am I, is, is what I'm doing coming from a place of love? Jesus's was. How can we be sure that what he did was an overflow of love? What did he do a few days later? Died for those same money changers? That's the long form of the argument. That's the extended dance mix that you put on if somebody brings up <laughs> flipping tables. Let's look at what was actually going on. Let's talk about the heart. Short form of the argument, the radio cut, is to say, let's look at the math. Jesus flipped tables two times in three years. We could say two times in 30 years of life, but let's just say he flipped tables two times in three years of public ministry. And we could say two hours, but, but let's say two days. Two days out of three years, two days out of a thousand days of public ministry were table flipping days. What does that mean? That means Jesus flipped tables one-fifth 
of 1% of the time. Jesus flipped tables. That means sometimes that's the right answer, Pastor. It's not what the math says. The math says even for Jesus, flipping tables was almost never the right answer. What is the right answer? Gentleness. Gentleness. Jesus flipping tables doesn't convince me, and I hope it doesn't convince you that gentleness is wrong. See the big picture. Consider the whole story. Jesus flipping tables reminds us that gentleness is right, and, and we shouldn't need to be reminded. Jesus already said it. Paul says it again and again, let your gentleness be evident to all. We heard that, Philippians 4, 5. Clothe yourself in gentleness, Colossians 3, 12. Be gentle toward everyone, Titus 3, 2. Colossians 3, 12 and Titus 3, 2, if you're taking notes. Paul says it again and again. James agrees, James 3.17, wisdom from above is gentle. Wisdom from above dictates, directs us to gentleness. Peter says the same thing. John has the same idea. It comes up again and again through Scripture. Why? Because every human being that you meet is a soul, like the money changers, a soul that Jesus died for. C.S. Lewis says there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. These pass. Their life to ours is as the life of a gnat. They're there, they're gone. But it's immortality that we joke with, work with, marry, snub, exploit. Souls destined for immortal horrors or everlasting splendor. Every human being you'll ever meet is a soul that Jesus died for. And his word tells us, and his spirit enables us, to handle those souls with care. To handle them the way that Jesus does. I hope I'm not coming across like I've got this figured out. Like I do this perfectly and constantly. I know I don't. I know that gentleness is important if we want to represent Christ. I know it's non-negotiable if we want to have any hope of truly being the body of Christ, but I know I'm not always gentle. And I used to blame it on all the years I lived in New Jersey. Or all the years that I spent on a football field trying to kill people. The reality is it's all the years I spent not knowing Jesus and all the years I spent after that not understanding that I needed to keep knowing Jesus and keep seeking Jesus and keep choosing Jesus because I need his strength to love and I need his power to be gentle and I need to keep walking in the spirit to have his strength and power to be gentle. And I'm still figuring that all out. I'm still working on it, and I, and, I, and I know I will be until I see Jesus face to face. My, my commitment, my, my commitment to, to, to you, to my family, is I'm going to keep trying. And my hope, my, my prayer, and my exhortation is, is that we'll try together. That you'll try too. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, right? We know this, Yes. <laughs> And the first step, a lot of times when he does, his first move is to try to divide. You've heard of divide and conquer? Satan invented it. And he's been working for centuries. He's been perfecting it. And his favorite place to practice it is in the body of Christ. He will make sure we misunderstand each other, get frustrated with each other, disagree with each other, offend each other, hoping eventually that we'll either go our separate ways, or go off on each other. You couldn't be more wrong, and you're not only wrong, you're what's wrong. And if you're smart, you'll listen to me, but you're not going to because you're not smart, are you? You're dumb, and I'm right, and you're not, so you should either listen to me or shut up or just go away and be dumb somewhere else because I'm tired of arguing with a dumb, wrong person who's wrong and dumb. In Jesus' name. <laughs> we can't do it. I mean, we can <laughs> We've done it. I've done it. We can't do it in Jesus' name. And we can't keep doing it and call ourselves the family of God. 
Because that's not what God does. God stooped down. Jesus stooped down in gentleness and met us when we were wrong, when we were stubborn, when we were rebellious. Jesus stooped down and came alongside us, and he was long-suffering. He worked and he waited and he waited and he worked. He explained and illustrated and listened and responded because he wanted us to come to him so that he could lift us up, so he could make us great. And now having come to him, he wants us to come together in him. And he does it knowing that we're going to have issues. He does it knowing that we're really different people who are going to see things from really different perspectives and we're going to have arguments. There's going to be conflict. And Jesus calls us together knowing that. He calls us together expecting that. He calls us together wanting to use that. Because Jesus redeems. He calls us together intending to use our disagreements and differences as opportunities to learn grace. Because every time we get sideways with each other, it's an opportunity to give grace. It's a chance to ask for grace. It's a chance to receive grace. It's a chance to learn grace. Which means we shouldn't run away from conflict. Jesus wasn't afraid of disagreement. That's not what gentleness is. Gentleness is not conflict avoidant. Gentleness seeks and speaks the truth. But gentleness speaks the truth in love. And gentleness doesn't assume the truth is always self-evident. Gentleness doesn't say, well, that's the truth. If you don't see it, you're dumb. If you don't like it, you have a problem. If you see it different, go somewhere different. If you don't agree, you're not one of us. And gentleness disagrees Gently. Gentleness says, if you see something differently, hey, let's reason together. Help me understand your point of view, because I'm not seeing it, but I want to. And I'll be glad to, to, to tell you about my perspective. Maybe we can both learn something here. Not with the, 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 the goal of homogeneity. Gentleness, gentleness doesn't want uniformity in all things. It just pursues unity in Christ above all things. Gentleness doesn't want blind conformity to rules or philosophies. It embraces rich diversity of of people and perspectives. It doesn't want grudging, tongue-biting, okay, I gotta love you because Jesus says I have to, white-knuckled tolerance. No, gentleness seeks genuine, spirit-empowered, Christ-honoring love. Even with people that ultimately we can't see eye to eye with. Because gentleness is love. And love is gentleness. And gentleness knows disagreement doesn't have to mean division. Disagreement doesn't automatically mean attack, and it doesn't mean that I have to mount a defense. Disagreement's an opportunity to love, and remember that love is others. Disagreement's an opportunity for me to consider who you are, where you've come from, where you've been, how you got here. What do you think? What do you feel? What, what, do you, what are you seeking? What are you trying to get? What are you afraid of? Who's helped you? Who's hurt you? Who's influenced you on your way to this place? But most of all, this agreement's an opportunity to pray. How can I bring Jesus into this conversation? Not to flip tables, but to minister wisdom and understanding. How can I bring Jesus into this conversation? Not to draw lines into the sand, but to, to try to erase him and pursue reconciliation. This agreement is an opportunity to bring Jesus into the conversation, not to issue ultimatums, but to seek unity in Christ, not to pronounce judgment, but to remember love. That's the person I'm trying to be. It's the pastor that I'm trying to be. It's the family that Jesus is calling us to be. Whether we're talking about the Bible or God or music or ministry or marriage or parenting or politics or anything. The way to follow Jesus in hard conversations is to be like Jesus, is to choose Jesus, is to walk in the Spirit, is to be gentle. And together as we choose to follow Jesus, we'll show people Jesus. Because who we are in Jesus can't be contrived or manufactured It can be imitated but not sustained. And in showing people the fruit of the Spirit, 
We'll point people to the source. We'll point people to Jesus. Hopefully, we'll lead people to Jesus. But even if we don't, it's not wasted time because we'll be worshiping Jesus, glorifying Jesus, magnifying his name. With our actions, we'll be declaring the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus who is gentle and lowly at heart, his words. Jesus who feeds his flock like a shepherd, gathers the lambs with his arm, carries them in his bosom, and gently leads them. Father, teach us these things. Teach us gentleness and with it all the other manifestations of love, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, we invite your Spirit to, to speak up Challenge us, convict us when we're not walking in the Spirit, when we've gone dry, when all of the Holy Spirit has leaked out and fallen on the ground. And Lord, as we call upon your name, we pray that you would, and we know that you will, again and again and again, fill us afresh, revive us anew with your Spirit overflowing us that the world might see Jesus living, serving. Loving in us.